Hey gang, we're, we're all in this together, okay? For the next 45 minutes, you're going to help me out, all right? So number one job, I'm not to trip on the chairs. Um, the, the other job is if you've got a question, wave it out. We've got, we've, we've got a, a chunk of time, and so just catch my attention and let's pick up on the conversation theme that's central to, uh, uh, to the day today. I, it's a long day, right, if you, if, you, if you kick back and just take one presentation after the other. Um, it, it's, uh, it, 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 these events, when I, when I travel, I always think how to get started. You know, different ways that, that you could get started. And uh, the, the, the obvious one that comes to mind for me is, um, you know, you, you start by talking about how I've been here before. You know, it's good to be back in, in Australia. Uh, and, and as it happens in my case, the last time I was here was for the Sydney Olympics. Uh, I was part of the hockey team, and, and that would be the field hockey team in, in, in this instance for Canada. And typically when we'd come to Australia, um, it was to take a lesson from the kookaburras. And, and uh, uh, in fact, last time I was in Melbourne, it was a lesson of about 6-0. Uh, and and uh, all I can remember is this fellow Steve Davies, and he was running behind me. I was the sweeper back, and, and uh, so I struggled to, to keep up with him. But the experience in Sydney, we played opening night, 7 p.m., the marquee event against Pakistan. And um, I don't know if you remember if anyone went to the hockey venue or anyone, anyone go to the Olympics? Yeah, a few folks. They, they dug into the ground. Right, they, they dug into the ground, raised the earth up, put in a temporary stadium, 20,000 people. Uh, it felt like there were 20,000 Pakistanis cheering, and, and, but, but the sound didn't escape. Right? The, the sound just sort of echoes because we were sort of underground. And um, so off we come, the drums are going, it's all green, right? Maple Leaf, good Canadian folks, and, and we come out and our thing was we would run. We would run sort of the, in our half. Uh, in, in a loop, right? 16 guys, and for me, 30 years old at this point, it was my second Olympics, and it was the end, right? That was, this was going to be it. First game, big event. We'd made it back to the Olympics, 12-year hiatus for me, right? 88, 2000, and so we're running, a whole bunch of us, veteran guys. And the thing that I remember the most was how fast it went. We just started running, and it's like we couldn't slow down. We're just warming up, right? We're just warming up, but the pace just kept picking up and picking up and picking up and picking up, and eventually our captain, he's like, you know, stop. We just had to stop. And it stuck with me, that feeling, eh? The whole, the, ever since. It's this amazing thing. 16 people, right, who had invested all this time, all this energy around making a difference, chasing a little white ball, kind of silly, right? Um, but, try, but making a difference, something for ourselves, something for the country, and, and in that moment, the opening night, with all of that, it's like we were relentlessly together. Like you couldn't separate. We actually had to stop in order to get back on track. And so we did, and off we went to the games. But it sticks with me, that feeling, eh? Relentlessly together. So I thought that would be a good way to start, right? That story would be where it's Sydney, you know. And sure enough, they even had the video on collective impact right before my talk. It was just perfect, right? So, so I thought, well, we could, st we could start with hockey. Well, that's the other hockey. Um, but, but then I thought, no, another good way to start would be to endear myself to you and talk about what I did on Sunday. I arrived here. It's Melbourne. I went for a coffee. I walked, you know, 10 meters later. Went for another coffee. Uh, another 10, you're right. But then I ended up at the Savoy. Anyone been to the Savoy before? It's a little pub on the way to the Docklands, right? Had a beer with some mates. And then I went off to the footy, and uh, I got a new team. Hey, the Bulldogs. Hey? Hey, we got one. I was told there would be no one. <laughs> um, and, 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 but the only reason I got the Bulldogs is because when I walked in, I sat down, and there was a fellow. He had a beer, wearing blue, right? He had a toque on, which is Canadian, so I thought that would be good. Blue toque. Watching, watching the game, and the, the fellows in orange and brown, I didn't think that looked so good. They were the giants, bulldogs against the giants, right? You know what I did? I got a beer, too, and I got one of those little things, the, um, the, the pastry things, the, the steak, steak pie. What do you call it? It's like a number. Four and 20. Four and 20, okay? Now you're helping me out. This is the conversation part. This is good. So I had the four and 20, and I got the tomato sauce. It's not ketchup. It's tomato sauce. I got that part figured out. 
and she, what did I do? I'm looking at it, I'm trying to peel it, squirt. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I thought that would be a good way to start. I would endear myself to you. A little bit of pandering around footy. It's Melbourne after all, right? I, in Canada, if you come, all you got to do is talk about coffee and a donut. Hey, okay? Tim Hortons, if you go, you'll figure it out. But the, but the other way, how many people here have children, I don't know, age 18 to 25, let's say? Hands up, you've got a child. Okay? I know where they are. They're in Whistler. Right? <laughs> hey, you're skiers. This is good. They, all the Australians, off you go and you run the chairlifts. And, it, and, it, and, and, and we're so happy for it. You send good wine, you run the chairlifts and you pour good beers, and, um, and this is the other way that I want to start. It's the actual way that I want to start. And I want to tell you what's in this picture, because we hold it in common. It's not the hockey part. You guys play, you know, my kind of hockey. Well, all Canadians, you know, we're kind of tied to the ice. Um, but that's a friend of my son. My son's a, a, a little guy. This is, this is Jacob. Um, and he's happy. Whatever's happened, he's happy. And what you can't see just to the left of Jacob is Chad. Okay, my son, I don't know where he is. He's out there somewhere, I guess. And, and this fellow up above there in the top left, he's the coach. Love that coach. Positive reinforcement, right? That's a picture of their spring hockey team. And that team's made up of a group of kids from our neighborhood called Chelsea, living in Quebec. And then a group of kids from the Manawaki First Nation. And through sport, they've come together to play a bit. And through philanthropy, that coach, who's the elder in the community, is able to support that team. So I got here today, and I sat right over there. And at the beginning, it was like I was just in Canada. The elder came in, and he greeted us. And I thought of our Algonquin peoples. And then right before my talk, here's Noel and Mark having a conversation. This is a shared history that we have, and it's the best place to start. I think Australia and Canada does have a shared history. There we are. In the context of philanthropy, help me out. You know, how, how are you doing in Australia? Donations are, are growing? Yes or no? Yeah, they, they are. They're growing. You know what, Canada? In decline, right? In decline. Community foundations, we've taken off, 191. A, almost 90% of Canadian communities have access to a community foundation. In Australia, it's still emergent, some 35 or so. How can we help change that, build the kind of community philanthropy infrastructure to make a difference? Uh, what else is happening in philanthropy? In Canada, how do I go about... Um, In, in Canada, it's still good? Yeah, okay. The, the, um, the, the situation is, is, is such where some things are changing, where on the one hand, massive transfer of wealth, right? Biggest transfer of wealth ever. So community foundations, record year last year, huge, huge influx of wealth, right? All you boomers, right? And those a little older than the boomers, all these estates are moving in. Huge wealth transfer. You know, Doc Seaman Fund and the Calgary Foundation, 117 million. There'll be one bigger than that this year again. And it's just going to be this wave of asset transfers into philanthropy. Really, really fascinating to see this shift. At the same time, donations are down. Okay? Hmm. How, how do we square that circle? The, the other thing that's going on is um, it's changing. So there's a d dynamic duo in Vancouver. Jane and Stephen Cox of Cause and Effect, and they just put on an event called Fuel, a whole urban revitalization event for Vancouver. Right? They crowdsourced and they crowdfunded the whole thing, not a single donation, not a single tax receipt, not a single piece of formal philanthropy. Right? Wouldn't show up on the radar, wouldn't show up on Statistics Canada or the Canada Revenue Agency's roles. We, we wouldn't even bring it into the scene unless we looked for it. We are looking in a different place. Or uh, we'll hear maybe from Lucy and, and, and Brad, our, our friends from the US, about what's changing in this space as well, a little bit later. But we know, for instance, that the National Endowment for the Arts, big arts funder, it's been outstripped 
in its contribution to the arts by Kickstarter and that whole crowd platform, online platform. So big disruptions. Big disruptions in the world of philanthropy, big disruptions in the world of uh, community foundations, both growth and change, big disruptions in globally how it plays out. Much to share about how we experience those disruptions. I, th I think one of the other things that we're seeing is that as this change happens, right, as these patterns of philanthropy change, there's an opportunity for us to consider what we do with the capital. How we embed the capital and community in the context of a community foundation. How, if there's $3.8 billion of an asset, can we deploy a great big part of it? And, uh, and, and this we'll touch on just a little bit as one of five levers. I'm going to talk about the five levers of, of philanthropy as we see them. And when, and when you think about them, um, consider what's missing from the conversation. And we'll pick that up at the end. The, the levers are things that we're experiencing as in Canada as being fundamental to grabbing hold of the bigger picture. The bigger picture of why philanthropy matters, why we're engaged in this, why we think it's an important part of Canada's social contract, citizen, state, corporation, how, how that whole thing is negotiated. So first, the first lever, first of five levers, and you can pick and choose, right? We're in this together, pick and choose, raise your hand, don't, don't forget. Uh, here's the first one. Anyone been there before? Any ideas? Yeah? Shout it out. Where are we here? Hey? Rocky Mountains? Yeah, where, where in the Rockies? Banff. You got it. Well done. The, um, if, you draw, if you start east of there, let's say you start in Winnipeg. That's in Manitoba. And you pick up the train. So off you go. You're heading west. You go through Saskatchewan. That's the really, really, really flat one, okay? Dead flat, or dead straight, off the train goes. You come through Alberta, and the Rocky Mountains just rise up. Like it's dead flat, and then it just rises up. And as you encounter the mountains, if you're a historian in the Canadian context, you only can think about one thing. It's like, who thought when they went west that when they got to the mountains, they said, I know what we'll do. We'll build the country by taking a train through there. Right? Taking a train to connect the whole country all the way out to the west coast. Hugely aspirational outlook. An impossible engineering task at the time. And it ended up uniting the country. It brought confederation together from the Pacific to the Atlantic. My hometown of Vancouver, you know, now we're part of the confederation. The sense of aspiration that existed in that time carried on in the Canadian milieu. Canadians had ideas like we would socialize Medicare, we would make it universal. Uh, we went from educating young people in you know, the, the, the church Monday to Friday to actually formalizing and making accessible universal education. We think of these things as sort of just adopted uh, I think of these things as in, internal, as if they've always been there. They're inherent. Well, they weren't. They were grand choices, big choices, big aspiration. Not a sense of we would educate some or provide health care to some or we would leave some in or some out of Canada's grand geography, but a huge aspiration. And in the intervening time over this last, say, 20 to 30 years, this is the thing we've lost. That bigger vision, that bigger sense of aspiration. And it's happened at a time when for corporations, it's been a struggle to sustain a balance sheet, right? Selling the assets we heard here in order to keep it afloat, right? And for governments, huge downward pressures on their fiscal capability. And so what we're experiencing in Canada is that this space to dream like this, to have a sense of broader public purpose, is opened up and what's stepping into that space are the space of philanthropy uh, not philanthropists per se not just like the one or the one individual but a sense of purpose of civil society and and the spirit of reconciliation between aboriginal peoples and non-aboriginal peoples in canada 
has been spurred on by that kind of leadership as one such example. There's a long, long ways to go. So this is a lever. This, I, I never thought when I started this job three years ago that the primary, the primary job was to remind people that we were in the business of having a whole lot of courage. It's actually, a, it's something we lose, eh? We let go of it from time to time. And that, that bigger purpose, that broader sense of intention, we need to be reminded of. And a day like today, I mean, already, we're not even at lunch yet. And a day like today, you're already feeling uh, how that pivots and shifts and the opportunities that open up just through the interactions, one with the other, or by listening to folks up on stage. Here's a second lever. Knowledge, or in the community foundation context, we talk about community knowledge. Those are a couple young people from Ottawa at Cat and Jay. And what they're doing there, they're picking fruit from a tree. Uh, and their story starts from that simple notion, really simple notion. That tree's on public land. And uh, I don't know if it's fruit or a nut tree, but uh, th they thought, what if we could harvest that, uh, uh, the fruit or the nuts from a tree and take it off to the food bank? That would be a good thing. And it was, and so they did that. And then they said, what if we had 365 days of the year, 365 trees? We would be harvesting and bringing something to the food bank, and we would have a cohort, let's say, of 365 volunteers putting their time and energy into that purpose. So they did that too. Either people's own fruit and nut trees are the ones nearby on public lands. And then they said, well, what if, how many trees might there be? Could we scale this up? Would there be an impact? And this is where the knowledge piece kicked in. They went off to our city hall at Ottawa, and they asked, and the city said, yeah, actually, we have a database of every tree on public land. They screened the database. There's how many trees? Guess how many trees? Ottawa, a town of a million folks. Any idea? How many trees? 10,000. Nice. In the ballpark. Anyone else? 150,000, not bad, 40,000 trees. 40,000 trees with an annual harvest. And actually the city knew where they were. The city had been funding the food bank for I don't know how many years, right? But a lot. And never had we made the link. The database sat quietly tucked away over here. Why did we have the database? Because we needed to know where the trees were to protect the power, co power lines, the phone lines, right? Chop them down when they were getting in the way of the transmission of power. But we couldn't make that link. Now, you're going to hear from Lucy and Brad later today, and I want you to listen hard, you know? Listen hard, because this space, we think this is one of the grand levers. If we can tap community knowledge and trigger it, we can make a big difference without spending another dime. Right? And our community foundation, we're getting behind the social enterprise that Kat and Jay have put together uh, there at the Community Foundation of Ottawa. R remarkable thinking. A couple of engineers that found themselves trying to solve a problem and then scale up a solution. All going well, there'll be hidden harvest right across Canada uh, by the end of it. In philanthropy, know that you have a unique position to broker knowledge. You can broker knowledge out of the private sector. We heard about some of that today, just listening to the two bankers. There's a deep understanding of a business process or a practice, right? There's a way of working. And in philanthropy, we can tap into that on the business side. We can also build a relationship with governments. City of Montreal, Open Montreal, the Fondation de Grand Montréal, they're in there triggering the release of all that data open data program and making it accessible to civil society organizations. Hopefully those organizations, like our foundations, will be smarter as a result. The other trigger, relationships. That's my hometown. That's in Vancouver. That's a park. Vancouver Foundation, largest foundation in the country, about a billion dollars in assets, um, making grants at around 50 million a year. And that's a neighborhood small grant. That's a $500 grant at work. Okay, it's a little park in the east side of town. And the reason I bring it up is not actually anything to do with the grant. Uh, it's not anything to do with the size of the corpus of the Vancouver Foundation. It's actually none of those things. It's uh, a learning.
that took a long time for the Vancouver Foundation to reveal. And what they did is they went out, this is about five years ago, and they said, we think we're missing the mark because for all these years, some 75 years, Vancouver Foundation has been a acting in a traditional way, supporting philanthropy in that city. And they weren't really seeing a fundamental shift. The things that they could observe around them, the ongoing challenge of homelessness, food insecurity in an abundant place, right? It's a rainforest, you can grow anything there. Uh, they, they, they saw the challenges of, of mental health, substance abuse, the downtown east side, it's one of the toughest neighborhoods in the whole planet. This concentration of intractable poverty, substance abuse, and mental health challenges in, the, in, in a four block radius. Just an epicenter of concern. And, and they wonder, why was this playing out? So off they went. Interviews, research, trying to draw out what's the bigger story. And what they heard back was something completely different. What they heard back from Vancouverites was a sense of, we're lonely, we're disconnected, we're disengaged. This is the city with the most use of social media in all of Canada. And the sense that uh, we don't know our neighbor. We, they, they asked Vancouverites, can you name anyone that lives on the same street as you? Right? 64% of Vancouverites couldn't name a neighbor. And so there's this sense of disconnection from the concerns of the community. Ugh, disconnection from just each other, period. And so there's a... a an incredible report called Connect and Engage that really tells a story of loneliness in a digital age. Uh, the, the, the university president, uh, Stephen Toop, a fellow from the University of British Columbia, said the worst thing that happened to Vancouver was the garage door opener. Right? Get up in the morning, it's Vancouver, big coffee town too, have my coffee, get in my car, click the garage door opener, back out, drive out to the university, into the underground parking lot, lots of rain in Vancouver, right? Park the car, into the elevator, up, back, don't know, don't get to know one another. So, this sense of meaning in our lives is really, really key. This sense of relationship. And again, I would say, how come working in community philanthropy, I've talked about three of five levers, one of them's about courage, one of them is about knowledge, and one about, is really about a sense of meaning in our lives, that this is what 21st century philanthropy is going to be centered on. It's also going to be centered on risk. I, I, I tell a story. This is um, the Gatineau River. This is where I live now. You start where I live in Chelsea, and you go straight north, and you, uh, you, you reach the headwaters of the Gatineau and the Ganeskanage River, and that's where uh, those hockey-playing friends of my son live. So the river really connects us. It runs dead north-south. Eventually that water heads all the way out to St. Lawrence to the Atlantic Ocean. And there's a little canoe club, a little paddling club. My kids are paddlers, canoe, kayak. And they, they, they use different boats than that one. That's a traditional Canadian canoe. But they use the ones where you race, you know, Olympic sport, get on one knee. And if you've ever watched little kids learning to canoe, You'll see the boats are sort of wrapped around the dock. So just imagine, there's the dock. Got a few boats wrapped around. And then you got these little kids, right? So I think of my daughter, Sophie. She's eight years old. And they put on the big life jackets, right? So big life jacket, their head kind of sticks out. They got the big paddle. They go down, and the coaches are there, and they're just yelling, right? They're saying, two feet on the dock. Two feet on the dock, two feet on the dock. They, the, the worst thing for the coaches is they got kids tipping in, falling in, landing on the boats, two feet on the dock. And then they yell out, one foot in the boat, one foot in the dock. And there's Sophie, right, blonde hair, <laughs> makes the move, she's like this. And then two feet in the boat. <laughs> and, and what happens? Right, these boats are really narrow. It's that whole wobble, wobble, wobble. And inevitably, what? Tip. Right, in they go. And the part that always catches my imagination is then they just pop right up back on the dock go through it all over again no problem right 
in the moment, as I watch Sophie tip in, I'm thinking, oh, no, you know, oh, no. For her, it's just, no, it's just part of the scene, right? Just part of that process. And, and I took that lesson back to our team and the network at Community Foundation. I said, what, what's happened with us that we in philanthropy are so resolutely two feet on the dock, you know? We're really good here, and we're kind of pretty good here. But boy, we have a, we have a real challenge to be kind of all in. We, we actually fear failure. And we've heard a couple times today the encouragement, you know, and Bill and Melinda Gates, they encourage the sense of failure. An organization in Canada called Engineers Without Borders, they now produce a failure report. They want to celebrate how many times they've fallen into the water. They think by doing that, they're going to free up some space to say, no, it's not all about what's in the results, you know, based management framework. It's not all about, you know, what you set out to do and did you achieve it or not. That this pattern of work that we've sort of adopted and brought into philanthropy, we need to rethink. We need to give ourselves space for risk. And for this audience, I would say you can extend the opportunity to risk to others. And there's nothing more powerful. Think of it with your kids. You do that for your kids. You create an environment where they can risk. And when they do, there you're there, right? Back on, right? Back in, Sophie, back in. Hey, you got it this time. And off she goes, paddling out, learning to paddle. And so this, this is the fifth lever. But this is the one, I've been talking about it all the way through. Talking, talked about it all morning. The video talked about it, right? And I love this picture because when we look at this picture and we think about the impact we're going to make through philanthropy, where does our gaze go, right? Naturally, our gaze just goes straight out here towards the red ball. We think, that's us, right? That's the Community Foundation Network. We really have it figured out. $158 million in grant making last year, that's all loaded up in that red ball, right? Here it comes, you name it. We're working on youth issues, seniors issues, conservation, right? All sorts of different things. We load up the red ball, boom, impact. It's gonna happen. The lever's not the red ball. It's not that one. The lever, it's lining them all up. That's us. That's the opportunity. It's the lining them all up. Lining them up together. Bringing other pieces to the table. It's not just us and what our inputs are. It's the full potential. And so if the search is going to line up the balls, like be there, right? Right? Or, or go off to, hey, help me out here again. What's the thing at the Sydney Opera House? Hey? Come on. Good, good pitch. They're lining them up. Right? Our friends at the government line me up. Thank you very much for bringing me down. That was very nice. Right? Line them up. And that brings me back to where I started. That's the lining up. That's the feeling we had when we lined up at the Olympic Games, that field hockey team. This whole feeling of, hey, yeah, then we can do it. In fact, we could barely hold ourselves back. Right, that sense of being relentlessly together, that's the big Australian. You have this in your DNA. I mean, I, I, this is the common thread, I think, with the Canadian-Australian experience. You know so well to how, how to be the team. You know, the kookaburras would show it to us every time we came here, right? So take the moment, if you can, to make your philanthropy about that kind of impact, you know, that kind of collective impact. So. I, ju I, ju I just want to do two things, okay? Two things to close. Because again, I thought, how am I going to finish, right? I thought hard about how was I going to get started, how was I going to finish, okay? Hopefully, I still left some time for a question or two, but Anne, Anne is going to let me know, okay? No, okay. Okay, L Louise just shut me down. Um, the two things in closing. One is come to Canada, okay? <laughs> just come. We'll take care of you, right? And second thing, 
I think it's Hawthorne over Geelong on Friday night. Hey? Okay? All right. Thanks very much. Cheers.